This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 699, recorded on November 14th, 2020. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Today, we have a very special episode for you. It is an episode taking place for the annual meeting of the American Society for Tropical Medicine and Hygiene. And of course, this year, like all other meetings, uh, it's a virtual meeting. Uh, and what I have done is to grab uh, five attendees, attendees in air quotes, right? Uh, who are participating at the meeting, probably giving talks. And we're going to talk about uh, their careers and their work. And of course, the one thing in, there is one thing in common, and that's virology, of course. This is this week in virology after all. But there's another thing in common, which is they're all arbo virologists, arbo, uh, which means arthropod born virus. Um, and you, everyone should know what an arthropod is. Uh, so uh, that's going to be a theme throughout today. So let me introduce uh, my participants who have agreed to do this on a Saturday. I really appreciate we are from France to the East Coast to the uh, West California, but also Colorado. This is just great. Power of Zoom, power of the internet. From Virginia Tech, Jonathan August, welcome to TWIV. Thanks for having me, Vincent. Pleasure. From Colorado State University, Carol Blair. Hello, Vincent. Thank you for inviting me. Colorado State, where we were supposed to have ASV this summer, this past summer. Yeah. I was so looking forward to that. I love I love Fort Collins. Oh, well. From Stanford <laughs> University, Desiree LeBeau. Welcome to TWIV. Thank you very much, Vincent. Hi, everybody. Hi, the, Desiree. You're the earliest here. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, from the Institut Pasteur, Louis Lambrecht. Welcome. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me. I'm really glad to be here. And uh, for you, it's like 6 p.m., right? That's right. Okay. The latest. Uh, and from uh, Hugh, Hugh Preto Medical School, which is in Brazil, Mauricio Nogueira. Thank, uh, welcome to TWIV, Mauricio. Hi, Vincent. Thanks a lot for having us. And everybody's in the cold weather. We are in a very hot day here. <laughs> is it summer there now for you? Yeah, it's summer, 87 Fahrenheit. Wow. Um, getting and hot. What? Lots of mosquitoes. <laughs> oh, yeah, for sure. <laughs> and Carol, you yeah, said yeah. it was going to snow today uh, where you are. Is it snowing? Uh, no, it's just very, very windy, like uh, 50 mile an hour winds. Okay. Yeah. We've got rain in California, which is incredible. Ah. Oh, yeah. Now, what's are you still having fires there in California? Uh, most of the fires are under control, so the, the air okay. quality is much better. It's back to good okay. air. Finally, that was really awful, actually. And what's the, the what's the weather like in Paris, uh, Louis? It was a pretty mild day today. A mild fall day, but not quite as warm as in Brazil, of course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, summer in Brazil. But Brazil is in the same time zone as us, right? As the East Coast, more or less, right? Uh, we are two hours behind you. Two, okay. Right now, yeah. All right, so let's chat a bit about... Uh, I want to talk about your training, how you got to where you are today. Uh, let's let's start. I want to know where you're from and, and PhD, um, MD, postdoc, etc. So, Jonathan, uh, where are you from? Hi, Vincent. Um, let me just start by saying actually that I'm really happy that I guess my first Twitter appearance <laughs> is somewhat connected to ASDMH because um, ASDMH actually had a large role to play in my professional development throughout my career. So I'm kind of happy about that. Um, I actually completed my undergraduate degree and my PhD at the University of the West Indies in Trinidad and Tobago. So Caribbean boy, really close to Brazil. Um, uh, I'd probably start by saying I wasn't particularly interested in academics as an undergrad. 
Um, I was more into athletics. Um, it took one professor that actually challenged me. <laughs> I was very competitive by nature. Um, because he actually challenged me, he actually got me to focus a little more. And that same professor actually recommended me to Dr. Christine Carrington for my PhD research. She's one of the um, more famous virologists in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, and I didn't, I didn't even know what a PhD was or entailed <laughs> leaving undergraduate degree. We didn't have formal undergrad research programs like they do here in the US. Mm. Um, but the project did sound very interesting. And Dr. Carrington went out on a limb for me because I had a very really weak GPA leaving my undergraduate degree. Um, but I had a fantastic PhD. Um, it was challenging, as is most PhDs. Um, and there's a lot of challenges with international research, as many of them, as many of the researchers on here actually would know about, like Desiree for sure. Um, but Dr. Carrington, uh, she was a really great mentor. And I finished my PhD in about four and a half years looking at molecular virology. Um, it was very productive. We had about eight publications at the end of that, but we were kind of, we were very, we were rewarded by the receipt of like the best dissertation thesis um, that year by the University of the West Indies, St. Augustine campus. So that we had like a nice reward from all of our hard work together. Um, that's uh, the completion of my PhD. That's when I actually faced my first crossroads in life. Um, I was offered a postdoctoral position by Scott Weaver at UTMB. And I also received the ASM CDC fellowship to go to the um, CDC. And that was a major, that was a major crossroads because I always wanted to go work for the CDC as a, you know, up and coming virologist. That's kind of the goal in life. Um, it took actually an award from ASTMH, a Robert E. Shope International Fellowship that sort of swayed my decision to move to UTMB. Um, I did visit Scott Weaver's lab a few times during my PhD, so it was it was a, it was a decision that I knew what I was getting into. Um, so that decision was it was a very good decision. <laughs> I'm moving to UTMB, which most people know as one of the leading infectious disease institutes across um, internationally. I had a lot of role models and a lot of arbo virologist role models to look up to. But I had two really great mentors at UTMB, Dr. Scott Weaver and Dr. Bob Tesh. Um, they spent a lot of time with me over four years training me and pretty much just always having that open door. So I was really lucky with the degree of mentors that I have, the degree of quality mentors that I had. Um, upon come about four years in, I actually received a K-22, which is a career development award from the NIH. I actually had no plans to leave UTMB whatsoever. Um, I didn't think I would do exceptionally well if I left. Um, but for some reason, my role models and mentors thought I could. And they sort of like helped me push me out the door <laughs> a little bit. Um, so that was really interesting. I guess they saw something in me that I was completely blind to. Um, but I did apply for jobs and I was offered a position at Virginia Tech, which had a really good group of scientists that I met. And we just spoke about XJ earlier, who was actually one of the reasons I decided to actually come to Virginia Tech. Um, again, so I've been at Virginia Tech since 2017. I guess like most junior or most assistant professors, we think we're doing a really bad job until we start getting the rewards <laughs> from our research. Um, so it's been, it's been a really good time. I think we finally settled down as a, an assistant professor. I had received my first um, NIH funded R01 this year. So it's, so it's on the way. Uh, I've seen some progress in my students and everything. So um, all in all, a pretty good long-term story there. Great. Hey, I have to say that this, uh, I was first approached over a year ago by Greg Ebel, which uh, all of you probably know, to do this TWIV at the meeting. And of course it was canceled. <laughs> so that's why we're doing it now. And I should also say that I visited uh, Galveston last year um, with Rich Condit. We did a couple of TWIVs there. Bob Tesh was on one of them. It was fun. It was a great time. And I love hot, humid weather. So 
It was perfect. Yeah, that's for me. the place to be. <laughs> it was absolutely perfect for me. So uh, you you were not interested in science from a young age. You were you were an athlete. You said what kind of that's sports correct. did you? What kind of sports? So, growing up in the Caribbean, you kind of do a bit of everything until you start getting medals, and then you switch and do something else and get more medals. <laughs> um, so we does that's what we did. We did like swimming, martial arts, okay, basketball. Yeah. So you're going to do that in science. You're going to do well and then switch to something else. You think? <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope not, but we'll see. Okay. Um, Carol, where, where are you from? Okay. I uh, <clears throat> grew up um, in a rural area of uh, around Salt Lake City. There aren't any more rural, rural areas around Salt Lake City. <laughs> uh, but um, I went to the University of Utah <clears throat> and... Uh, well, <laughs> when I was a kid, I loved getting out into nature. And uh, my brother and I used to go and catch lizards and snakes and toads and things like that, <clears throat> bring them home, <laughs> turn them loose in my dad's garden. So at the University of Utah, I was um, uh, interviewed for a job as a lab assistant and uh, the head of the department who interviewed me said, are you afraid of snakes? And I said, why, no, I'm quite good at catching snakes. <laughs> and he said, you're hired. <laughs> and so uh, I worked for two graduate students who were some of the most influential mentors I ever had. One was Joel Dalrymple, and the other was uh, John Stanton. <clears throat> Unfortunately, mm -hmm. both of them are gone now, but uh, I th they just had so much fun doing research. I decided this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> the snakes I caught uh, were part of my bachelor's thesis because our um, question was, how does Western equine encephalitis virus overwinter? And one, uh, uh, well, we had several possibilities. One was in bats, uh, mm -hmm. and I raised some baby bats too, <clears throat> but one was snakes. And so <clears throat> it turns out that indeed, uh, alpha viruses at least can infect snakes. The snakes don't get any uh, uh, disease at all. But the question was, uh, <clears throat> Could they be part of the cycle? So I have some great photographs in my uh, bachelor's thesis of snakes on the head, uh, a snake, and on its head are two uh, <clears throat> mosquitoes, Culex tarsalis mosquitoes, drawing blood. <laughs> hmm. wow. So that, wow. that was so much fun. <clears throat> then I went to the University of California at Berkeley to do my PhD. <clears throat> That was not about arboviruses at all, but I learned molecular virology. <clears throat> so uh, I met an Irishman in California and uh, went to Ireland to marry him, <laughs> lived in Ireland for seven years, was on the faculty at Trinity College, Dublin, huh. and loved both teaching and research, but still wasn't back to arboviruses. <clears throat> But um, I, <laughs> I don't know uh, whether any of you are familiar with the weather in Ireland. Um, it doesn't get cold. It's just kind of cloudy all the time with lots of rain. So I decided we're going to move back to the U.S. Besides, um, I, I wasn't satisfied with the education my children were getting in Ireland. So I uh, started looking for jobs in the U.S., and uh, my husband is a microbiologist also, so we were looking for two jobs in the same place. <clears throat> and uh, the one at Colorado State came up, and I jumped at the chance because it's just over the mountains from uh, the University of Utah and uh, mm. similar climate, which I really like despite the wind. And uh, <clears throat> so um, when I came to Colorado State, I inherited a, uh, an NIH grant uh, on Japanese encephalitis virus. Mm. So I started doing molecular virology with Japanese encephalitis virus. 
Then I was fortunate that Barry Beatty was hired uh, to our faculty. I tried hard to influence that decision to hire him. And he <clears throat> had a dream of starting a center for arbovirus research, but more focused on the uh, interaction of viruses with their arthropod vectors. So uh, the CDC has a big lab focused on vector-borne diseases that's right across the road from Colorado State. And uh, the USDA used to have a vector-borne disease lab in Laramie, Wyoming, which is only about 50 miles away. Unfortunately, they moved to Kansas. But mm. uh, anyway, we did have and still do have a lot of researchers uh, in arbovirus and mostly vector interactions, but also, um, arth I mean, uh, vertebrate mm. interactions. <clears throat> so we've hired a wonderful group of young faculty, including Greg Giebel. And uh, my interest then turned back to mosquitoes because Barry is such an expert. So to cut a long story short, because my research career is a very long story, but recently, well, my understanding of molecular virology made me curious about why uh, humans can get so sick when they're infected with an arbovirus, whereas mosquitoes don't get sick at all and they continue the cycle, they get a persistent infection for life. <clears throat> so I wanted to see what the difference was, and we guessed that the difference was in their immune systems. <clears throat> and uh, that led us in the 1990s, the early 1990s, to get a grant uh, about <clears throat> the mosquito defense system against viruses. <clears throat> uh, we kind of stumbled upon RNA interference. And then <clears throat> when two papers came out in 1998, one of which earned the Nobel Prize mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. RNA interference in C. elegans, we said, oh, oh, that's what we're seeing. Mm -hmm. And so I've been studying RNA interference mm -hmm. in mosquitoes ever since. Now, we just had Tony Shouts uh, on TWIV not too long ago, your colleague there, right? That was a lot of yeah, fun. Yeah, and he, he's interested in, of course, viruses in bats, which, yeah. and he and I yeah. talk about this all the time because he keeps finding out, oh, bats get infected with a virus just like mumps virus. Oh, really? <laughs> so he's a great guy. I, uh, I was in Singapore in December at a Nipah virus meeting. And there I learned mm -hmm. that, you know, when... When the outbreak first happened, they thought it was an arbovirus, and mm -hmm. um, uh, they brought samples to Colorado. The CDC, uh, yes. the arbovirus part, as you said, was in Colorado, and then they quickly realized it was fusing cells. It wasn't an arbovirus; it was paramyxovirus. So it went to, to then it went to Atlanta. Great story. Yeah, <clears throat> Desiree, what's your story? Where are you from? This is fun hearing everyone's stories. Yeah, I'm enjoying this. And this is also my first podcast or Twitter or anything. So thanks for bringing me into the new age here. Um, I always say, you know, I guess it, it always kind of, your life makes more sense looking back on it than when you're in it, right? Going forward. But so I was born in New Orleans. Um, mm. I'm the only doctor in my family. I, um, I uh, went to college at UC San Diego. Um, I was always interested in science and and um, really like people. And so medicine seemed to be a good choice. And so I, I ended up going to medical school in the Midwest. I wanted to move out of California. Um, I wanted to go to a place with seasons. Um, so I, I applied for medical schools all over, um, not in California, and I, I, I really wanted seasons. So I ended up going to Medical College of Wisconsin, and I got seasons, lots of snow, and it was wonderful. I loved it. Um, and then chose pediatrics and um, headed to um, Rainbow Babies and Children's Hospital in Cleveland to do my pediatrics. And I was really interested at that time in what we called international health. And there were only two pediatric programs in the country that had international health tracks. So I went to Case and to Rainbow Babies for that. And so for my um, international rotation, I went to Asia for the first time. I went to Laos and I happened to be in Laos during the monsoon season when there was a gigantic dengue outbreak. Mm. And so I, I, uh, 
uh, was honored to take care of a lot of children who were very sick with dengue and some unfortunately who died of dengue during that time. And I didn't realize what an impact that had on me probably until a little bit later. Again, looking back, it all makes a little bit more sense, right? So I, I got back to case and, and my husband at the time was still in his neurosurgery residency, which takes a really long time. So I had some time to kill. So I decided to do an infectious disease uh, fellowship. And um, uh, just like what Carol and what Vincent just mentioned, or not Vincent, but Jonathan just mentioned about mentorship, I also um, stumbled upon a, a wonderful mentor, Charlie King. And we started working on, he was actually a schistosomiasis expert, but he had a biodefense supplement to his iCider grant on schisto on something he had never studied before and didn't know that much about called Rifali fever virus. And so I started, uh, I kind of took that project as my own. I always loved ecology and biology and people. So it all made sense to do something in vector borne diseases. And I had always really dreamed of working in Sub-Saharan Africa. And so I started working in Kenya on Rifali fever in 2003, and I just have never left it. And so I've just kind of continued. I, I, I worked at my first job. I got a master's of science, got my first grant. Um, again, it was a K-12 grant um, at Case, and then moved to California, um, was at Children's Hospital Oakland for a while, and then moved to Stanford about six years ago. And I'm still doing field epidemiology in vector-borne diseases, particularly arboviruses in Kenya, which is my, my main gig. But I also, Jonathan, I get to work in the Caribbean a little bit, which I love. So I'm working in Grenada and I love it there and I love the people. And then also in Brazil, how I know Maurizio. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, that's my story. But you're um, back in California with no seasons. I am, you know, I went to, I grew up, um, so I was born in New Orleans, um, but my dad was a carpenter and a contractor. And so we moved around a lot building right. houses and, um, I spent my youth sort of on this rotation moving between New Orleans, Houston, Texas, and San Francisco, just a lot. And, uh, so I ended up going to high school in San Francisco and, um, always kind of other than New Orleans, San Francisco has always been sort of a home place for me. Hmm. And so my parents were here. Um, both of them have passed on now, but my parents were here when I moved back a decade ago. And, um, and so I was really moving back to be with them and closer to family. And, and I do love California, despite the wildfires. It's a hmm. beautiful place to live and work. So for sure, for sure. We're very jealous of, of your weather. I have a podcaster from San Diego and Elio Schechter is always 72 and sunny. You know? Yeah, it was great in San Diego going to college there. It only rained <laughs> during finals week in March. <laughs> it's perfect timing. <laughs> it's funny when I told Carol we would do this on Saturday, she said, it's okay, it's just going to snow anyway. <laughs> 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 Which to me would be good reason to go outside. Uh, Louis, where, where are you from? I want to start by saying that it's also my first wave appearance. I'm really honored to be here. Wow, sure. Um, and my, my story is pretty straightforward, <laughs> I guess. Uh, I actually grew up in southwestern France in mm -hmm. a small village in the countryside. And as a young man, I guess I'm still a young man, but as a younger <laughs> man, I, I wanted to see the world. I wanted to travel. And so I did my undergraduate studies in Paris, where I specialized in ecology and evolutionary biology. And things started to get uh, interesting when I uh, did my PhD with, um, with my uh, advisor, Jacob Coela, who's an evolutionary ecologist uh, who was studying interactions between malaria parasites and the mosquito vectors. That's how I entered into the world of mosquitoes. And so that uh, PhD topic was attractive to me, not just because it, it, it dealt with an important public health issue, but also because it involved fieldwork. And in uh, that particular case, the fieldwork was in Kenya, like Desiree. So during my PhD, I was uh, lucky enough to spend a lot of time in Kenya catching mosquitoes, not catching snakes, but mosquitoes. And um, that's how I got into it, uh, I guess. And the other turning point later on was when I decided to do a postdoc in the U.S. I got a fellowship from the European Union, called the Marie Curie Fellowship, which allowed me to spend two years, which is a very short time, but it was enough to make really a, a big change. It was a game changer for me to go to the University of California in Davis in the lab of Tom Scott, 
uh, who many of uh, us know here. And Tom Scott, uh, who's a dengue expert, he's a medical entomologist and epidemiologist uh, who specialized in dengue. He really uh, opened the doors of uh, arbovirology to me because I switched from uh, mosquito transmitted parasites to mosquito transmitted viruses. So I didn't start off as a virologist, I kind of became one in a way. Um, and so uh, as a postdoc in Tom Scott's lab, uh, I did a lot of field work again. So this time it wasn't in Africa, it was in, in Thailand. And I'm also doing, well, later on, there was some projects in uh, Peru as well. And it was a turning point because uh, I started to get uh, really interested in the viruses themselves. Uh, and also because Tom is a great mentor and he really uh, turned me into a professional. Uh, I was a student before and then I became a researcher. Uh, back to France a few years later, I started my own group at the Pasteur Institute, and I've been studying arboviruses and their interactions with mosquitoes ever since. That's you know, my story. You know, when, uh, when, when we used to travel, my wife and I used to love to go to France every couple of years. We always went to the Southwest. That was our mm -hmm. favorite place. Uh, La Rochelle, um, Bordeaux, Arcachon, Biarritz. Close yeah, to those where are you, nice places. Yeah. yeah. Did you get a chance to go to Toulouse? I'm more from the part of Southwest near Toulouse. No, never went to Toulouse. <laughs> never went to Toulouse. Hopefully one day we will travel again, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I hope so, but it's going to be a while. I, you know, we have to fill out, as you do, these um, university conflicts of interest. And you have to say, okay, in the next year, where are you going to be going and who's going to reimburse your travel? And I said, Nowhere. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> For the next year, that was easy. And finally, that brings us to Mauricio. What is your story? Hi, Vicente. I, I was born in Brazil in a small city uh, in the countryside of Sao Paulo State. There was almost nothing there except a university uh, that was very important from the state point of view. And my father was a medical doctor in the city. My father, my aunt, I, ha I came from a family of physicians. So all my friends were, uh, my friends' parents were either physician or university professor. So pretty much I say, hey, that's a one of, uh, I want to do in my life, both. <laughs> so I went to medical school in Belo, Belo Horizonte, uh, Universidade Federal de Minas Gerais. Uh, it's a federal university in Brazil that has a long tradition of MD doing science. Yeah. This university was, uh, since the 50s and the 60s, the Rockefeller Foundation put a lot of money in this university to turn this in a US model of university in order to be um, professors doing basic science. That was not common in Brazil. So I went there, I did my MD there, uh, and I did that was in the early 90s. Uh, HIV was a major issue at that time. Uh, I was seeing people dying of AIDS every day, several, uh, when I was an intern. And uh, at one point I decided that, okay, virus is something that is really interesting to see. Uh, so when I finished, I, I, when I graduated, I decided that I wasn't going to be a clinician and I would be a full-time scientist. So I moved to the Biological Science Institute in the same university uh, and was enrolled in the graduate program in microbiology. I got a master and a PhD in virology there, working with herpes virus. Uh, at that time, I got an opportunity to move to NIH to do a postdoc position with Tom Christie. I don't know if you know him. Uh, Tom uh, was was really important in my life. Tom was uh, was a guy who did his PhD with Bernard Roisman, his postdoc with Phil Sharp. So <laughs> he has a very good uh, background. And they say, okay, this is how you do science in Brazil. This is how I'm gonna show you who really how you're gonna do science from now. And I spent four years in Tom's lab. And then September 11 came. Uh, at one point, was not well. NIH changed a lot at that time, from a from a campus, a university-like campus, to a place that you have 
to go to security every time that they go out of the building. Um, I, I decided that it was time to go back to Brazil. And I was offered a position here and I said, okay, so far so good, but I don't think that I will be competitive in Brazil for uh, working with herpes virus trans transcription control. That's not something that's going to be funded in Brazil. Uh, and then a good friend of mine, Professor Luis Tadeu Figueiredo from University of São Paulo said to me, I said, Mauricio, you go into São José do Rio Preto, my city. That city, it's a hot spot for arbovirus. You have to work with arbovirus. I had to work, I had worked before with dengue for a small time during my PhD. And say, okay, let's do that. Let's forget herpes. Let's start something from scratch. So I moved back to Brazil in 2004. Uh, to work with open, start a new lab. From It was really funny because I received an empty room, a huge room. Louis already came here. He knows my lab. It's a huge lab. But at that time, it was an empty lab. They put gave me a desk, a computer, and said, come on, man, go ahead. We count <laughs> on you. <laughs> well, this was 16, uh, yeah, 17 years ago. Uh, from there, we developed a um, a lot of, we did a lot of work. We developed a network of collaborations. Here we can see, we publish, I published with Jonathan, I published with Desiree uh, recently. Uh, Louis Awed came here in my lab. So uh, I think that was successful. I've been to Brazil twice to do TWIV, you know. Yeah, one of them, one of these times I was the president of society. We will be in the Brazilian Society for Virology meetings. Uh -huh. One of these the, the second one, I was the president of the society at that time. Yeah, I have to say, and I and I said this while I was there, I found the Brazilians to be the nicest people I ever met. They were so friendly to to one, you know, to everyone. They were really, uh, from the students to the professors, wonderful, really wonderful. I enjoyed it. You know, one thing that is um, becoming clear to me talking with all of you, another component of arbovirology is field work. And all, some of you have talked about field work. And when I went to Galveston, you know, I spoke. We did a podcast with Bob Tesh and Tom Kaizek and Jim LeDuc, and all of them said field work is so important. Yet it's really hard to do, and it's hard to get funded. And actually, Scott Weaver and um, others, we did another. They said the same thing. You know, we all need to do field work, uh, but uh, it's hard and. Not everyone wants to go away for months. So it's really impressive that you can do uh, that as well. Listen, that's the good thing about where I am. I don't need to go to do the field work. <laughs> my field work is <laughs> right there here in my city. <laughs> it's right. So yeah. Scott come here, uh, uh, people from you to maybe that you interview with, they come here to my place to do field work. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. All right, so let's, let's chat a bit about each of your science. So I went through and looked at what you've done. And obviously I have my own interests and I, I picked just things that I, I felt that would be a broad interest. So let's, let's start with Jonathan. Uh, you, you, I would like to speak with you about something that we actually have talked about on TWIV and uh, which I put in the new edition of our Principles of Virology textbook, these insect specific uh, viruses. So why don't you tell us a bit about those and, and uh, why they're useful? Uh, that's a that's a very broad question, Vincent. <laughs> I'll try to do my <laughs> best on this one. I know Louis also works on insect specific viruses, so he can also weigh in on this as well. On on also Carol, um, yeah. So insect specific viruses, um, they they have been discovered for quite some time, but with the advent of next generation sequencing and some of the high throughput studies that came out of those, we started discovering them at a rate. That was just phenomenal. Um, I remember, and this is a funny story I was telling my students, I remember in one mosquito pool, we actually found some like 60 new insect specific viruses hmm. in one pool of mosquitoes. And then I remember another study where I was speaking with some Laura Kramer's group and they found more viruses in their study than they could find names for. <laughs> so I think, they, I think they call it quits on, <laughs> for some of them. Um, but they've been around for a while. Uh, one of the first ones um, 
that, and one of the groups that have been most studied are the insect specific flaviviruses. Among all the arthropod-born viruses, you can discover insect-specific viruses for pretty much all the groups: flaviviruses, alphaviruses, autoimmuneviruses, uh, immuneviruses in general. Um, but in the 1990s and onward, that's when it, the research really ramped up uh, on the discovery of insect-specific viruses. And in the late 2000s, we started de um, developing applications for insect-specific viruses. Mm -hmm. So these viruses are uh, unique, uh, slightly different from regular arthropod-born viruses because they are unable to replicate in a vertebrate host. So even if they were to infect and cell, they're, they're replication incompetent. And we decided to take advantage of, of that um, phenotype. And what a lot of groups have been doing now, there's groups in Australia, a lot of groups in the US, we're actually developing chimeras um, with insect-specific viruses, where we substitute structural proteins from some viruses, like some pathogenic viruses, let's say, for example, West Nile virus, and you put that on an insect-specific flavivirus backbone. If you substitute all those proteins, you have viruses that look identical to West Nile, but still can't replicate in a vertebrate host because um, it's still host-restricted. The rest of the mm. genome is uh, still host-restricted in vertebrate cells. And that sort of led to a lot of um, several avenues of research. For one, these viruses can be able to be at biosafety level one or two, because again, it's very safe. So you can knock down a BSL-4 flavivirus pathogen to likely BSL-1 or BSL-2, which is very good for like diagnostics if you needed to actually use a, a virus uh, that resembled like a virus-like particle. Um, so that was pretty interesting. So there was a, a large shift into diagnostic research um, by using those those um, chimeric viruses. Then uh, at the same time, there was a, a lot of work that went into vaccine development, which is what Scott Weaver's group has been doing and Roy, Hall, Roy Hall's group in Australia and my group as well here at Virginia Tech, where we've been using these chimeras as, as pretty much vaccine candidates for both alpha viruses and flaviviruses. Um, I haven't seen anything come out yet with the um, segmented genome or, or the bunio viruses, um, respective vaccines. Um, and this, this, that has proven um, exceptionally safe and exceptionally immunogenic and effective vaccine candidates um, thus far. The other avenue of research that has been really, really interesting, and um, I think in, my Carol might be aware of some of this, is that these insect-specific viruses can um, sometimes prevent mosquitoes from becoming infected um, during a super infection with a pathogenic virus of the same group. So for example, insect specific flaviviruses can sometimes very strongly restrict super infection with a pathogenic flaviviruses. And we've seen that for the insect specific alpha viruses and insect specific mm. flaviviruses. It is somewhat species specific in that some insect specific um, viruses may not completely restrict it in vitro or in vivo, but um, for the most part, we do see some sort of exclusionary effect. So there's a lot of research that like de delineated into these three main categories. And then the last category that we've been using these viruses for is um, trying to understand interactions between the mosquito vectors and these insect-specific viruses. Mm -hmm. um, so they, again, they're a little different than the classical arboviruses, so they behave slightly differently. They persist for longer, there's high vertical transmission rates in mosquitoes. Um, it's probably primarily driven through vertical transmission um, in contrast to the arboviruses, which need that cycling through a vertebrate host. Um, and it's highly prevalent in nature. So um, that's, that's also quite, I mean, you can go in your backyard, set some mosquito traps and odds are you will find an insect specific virus. We've done that, we do that for student projects all the time. And, somebody wants to discover a new virus, you just say, okay, let's go look for some insect viruses. Um, but yeah, so that's some of the research that's been um, pick, picking up lately with insect-specific viral pathogens. So it's interesting, you know, the people who study bats say they have more viruses than anyone else, anything else on the planet, but maybe actually insects do, or arthropods, right? Because it sounds like you, you can, it's hardly been discovered, right? Yeah, that, that's a that's a great point. Yeah, bats are always uh, the the infamous, you know, the infamous horse. Yeah, um, I, I'll say I'll say arthropods will probably give them a run for their money with their, <laughs> um, <laughs> their viral microbiome. So, do do you know? You you mentioned that there's a block to the reproduction of these 
viruses and vertebrate cells. Do we know what the block is at what level? Yeah, so they have, um, I, some of the b best studies have been done with both the alpha virus and the flavivirus um, insect specific viruses. And it's been shown to be at multiple levels. Mm -hmm. um, some viruses are unable to actually attach and enter. Um, so it's, it's entry restricted and some are unable to translate proteins or replicate. So it's at multiple levels okay. um, of restriction. Okay. Do you know if anyone is uh, making a SARS-CoV-2 vaccine using these insect specific viruses? No, I haven't, I haven't heard of anyone. Surprising. Yet. <laughs> Yet. Yeah, all right yes. Yeah, okay. No, I, 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 um, it makes sense that um, insects would have more viruses. They've been around longer than mammals, right, <laughs> on the planet. So that makes a lot of sense. Uh, Carol, you mentioned that this is funny when you say mosquitoes don't get sick from these viruses, but maybe if you could ask them, they might not feel so well. <laughs> <laughs> but they don't they don't get a fever and uh, uh -huh. <clears throat> they're still able to fly and they're still able to bite. Yeah. You can actually measure uh the, the temperature of a mosquito. No, the mosquito has the same uh temperature as the uh ambient environment. Okay. So Okay. <laughs> so you mentioned that the, the reason you think that uh, there's, there's no pathology in mosquitoes is because of uh, RNA interference. Could you tell us a bit about that and how that would work? <clears throat> well, um, RNA interference um, involves uh, some uh, proteins that uh, exist not only in mosquitoes, but in almost all arthropods. And it turns out that uh, uh, like uh, Rodneus, uh, which uh, those of you who are in Brazil or have studied in Brazil would know about, but they also have these enzymes uh, mm -hmm. or proteins. So <clears throat> starts out with a an enzyme called Dicer, which recognizes the double-stranded RNA that is an intermediate in uh, RNA virus replication. And it uh, binds to this uh, double-stranded RNA, chops it up into... 21 nucleotide duplexes. These then are bound by Dicer and another uh, protein called R2D2. And <laughs> a lot of the names are borrowed from Drosophila. Their, their genes all have funny names. And uh, then they haul these little pieces of uh, duplex RNA to a big multi-protein complex called a, an RNA uh, induced uh, RIS sequencing, <laughs> or I mean silencing complex, RNA induced silencing complex. And one of the proteins in there is Argonaut 2. And Argonaut 2 is an endonuclease. And so it takes one strand of the duplex, binds it to uh, the RNA that's complementary, which would be in most mm -hmm. cases, a messenger RNA for the uh, replicating virus, and it cleaves it right in the middle of where that little RNA bound. And so it um, destroys the messenger RNA, the genome RNA of those viruses as they replicate. And so <clears throat> it just, uh, it doesn't completely eliminate the virus unless you, you know, uh, interfere or amplify the, uh, and we have done this, make transgenic mosquitoes that as soon as a uh, mosquito takes a blood meal, they uh, come in and, uh, I mean, it, it turns on the production of a double-stranded RNA from the mosquito genome that it matches the RNA of the infecting virus. So it's very much sequence specific, but it turns on Dicer immediately and that makes the mosquito completely resistant to infection. But in a natural situation after the virus has infected, then RNA ramps up, RNAi ramps up and uh, it just keeps the infection from overwhelming the mosquito but it doesn't completely eliminate the, the uh, virus. So the mosquito 
keeps the viral levels down enough so that it doesn't get sick yet the virus mm -hmm. can reproduce and move on to another host right so everybody's happy yes <laughs> yep everybody's happy except the next host who gets bit by the yeah. infected mosquito it's interesting because you know humans should have learned from this, from these uh, rna based immune systems because we have this complicated protein based system and and that in itself makes us sick right <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yes. If we didn't have interferon, but had uh, kept the RNAi, which uh, was in our genome and still is in our genome, yeah. but uh, the interferon system takes over. And as with SARS-CoV-2, that has been blamed for yeah. some of the uh, uh, pathogenic effects of the, the virus infection. Yeah. Someone had an idea to make a better immune system and <laughs> Evolution did that, and it probably wasn't a good idea. Yeah. Um, do you think that? I mean, I would guess that the RNAi system in mosquitoes could have evolved to completely eliminate viruses, but it didn't. Do you, do mm -hmm. you think that maybe some of these viruses may be beneficial to mosquitoes? That's a good question, but um, we guess that they're not necessarily beneficial, mm -hmm. but the virus has kind of manipulated the system so that it doesn't totally get destroyed, but it doesn't overwhelm the mosquito so that mm. it can complete the cycle and find another vertebrate in which to amplify. So do, do uh, these viral genomes encode modulators of the uh, RNA interference machinery? Some of them do, yes. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, for example, in flaviviruses, <clears throat> you know, they have um, a three prime non translated region yeah. that's highly structured. And that kind of uh, binds up some of the, uh, for example, Dicer 2, Argonaut mm -hmm. 2. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's a kind of contest going on between the mosquito host and the virus, both evolving. To try to keep up with each other. Yeah. So I'm sure you've heard about using Wolbachia to, you know, interfere mm -hmm. with dengue transmission. Do you think, can you use uh, RNAi in ways that you've suggested as well? Would that be a viable approach to um, controlling infection? We've, we've thought seriously of um, <clears throat> um, using the mosquito's um, gut uh, microbiome mm. Mm -hmm. uh, because there are a lot of uh, bacteria in the mosquito gut, and to transform one of those uh, bacteria, then to release uh, uh, virus double-stranded yeah. RNA, just as we did with the transgenic mosquitoes. And that paratransgenesis might be more acceptable to uh, regulating agencies, because with the transgenic mosquitoes, we really don't know uh, what the adverse outcomes could be. Right, right. So uh, would you say uh, there's still a lot to do in this area? There's still a lot to do. <laughs> yeah, I was on an, an NIH panel uh, <clears throat> and uh, there was one of the proposals about a Thogoto virus, mm -hmm. which is a tick-borne virus. And the the guy who was the first reviewer said, Where, will we ever run out of viruses, new viruses to work on? And I said, not in my lifetime. Yeah. And I think also um, you and others on this panel have worked on uh, the idea that in some cases, the mosquito genome may, may contain copies of viral sequences that can serve to produce mm. these interfering RNAs, right? That's, I've been, become very much interested in that because those uh, uh, viruses, well, pieces of virus genomes that are integrated into the mosquito genome uh, make PI RNAs, mm -hmm. which are undoubtedly part of the mosquito, uh, mm. the mosquito immune system. Yeah. And uh, we're very curious about how those get integrated so that they can be passed vertically and uh, provide some defense against invading viruses. Yeah, I, I think that's fascinating. I think Carla Sally at the Pasteur has worked on that in your lab as well is yeah. interested. Uh, yeah. 
Uh, so it's very cool. All right. Um, Desiree, I'm really interested. Uh, on your website, you say you have two large field projects in Kenya, and I, and I suppose uh, has to do with Rift Valley. So maybe you could tell, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, actually, um, we do have some Rafale fever work going on right now, but the two projects um, that are listed on our website, one of them's on um, trying to uncover the dengue and chikungunya burden um, in Kenya. And then another one is about plastics. Um, so um, so the first one is, uh, so we have a, an R01 um, funded by NIH um, looking at, again, the great burden of chicken dengue. And we do febrile illness surveillance in humans and then also community surveillance and then a lot of um, vector surveillance with our populations. Um, and we have found a lot of, of these infections. Um, we've recently published on just some of the phylogenetics of all four dengue strains in, in Kenya. It's very interesting because Carol started to mention this a little bit, just the, the spectrum of disease in humans is something that was always interesting to her. And, and you know, in, in Kenya, at least in our cohorts where we're working, we don't see a lot of very severe dengue there. And it's very interesting because we do have all four strains of dengue. And so you'd expect to see some. And, and we find that, that all four strains are circulating often all at the same time throughout the year. So it's just very interesting. Um, some of the work there, we've tied a lot of um, the human burden of disease. We also do a lot of climate measurements because we're interested in, in the transmission cycles and, and factors that lead to, to more disease in humans. And, and um, we've recently um, really tied and, and been able to validate um, using our field cohorts, some ecologic models of, of the impacts of climate and climate change on, on mosquito abundance and mosquito-borne disease in humans. And that's really interesting because um, we're showing that warming temperatures um, actually make uh, maybe the malaria burden a little less common because the Anopheles loves it at 25 degrees. Uh, but the Aedes aegypti mosquito really likes 29. So as we get warmer, um, it's not so much that that we're going to have you know vector borne diseases all over the world, but of course the the places where we will will shift right will will shift um, both the disease burden and also risk for disease. And so we're showing that um, this increasing temperature may actually drive uh, the burden of vector borne diseases in sub-Saharan Africa from malaria in some regions to arboviruses. So maybe we're going to be seeing more and more as time goes on. And so that's interesting. Um, and the other project I'll mention is the plastics one. Um, we we uh, had a very large school-based project in Kenya where we, again, we're doing some vector surveillance and a lot of community empowerment and education. And, and we realized that um, the places that were breeding a lot of mosquitoes were these just kind of uncollected areas of plastic trash out in the communities. And so uh, we pitted the schools against each other, had these you know, this almost like a trash pickup and uh, collected over a ton of plastic waste that we ended up having to bury because there's no recycling and it's terrible to burn it. Um, and we repurposed a lot of this, planted a lot of trees, but we thought, what are we going to do with all of this plastic waste? And now we have a project where we have actually started a so social entrepreneur program where we are kind of working with people along the informal sort of plastic recycling and reuse trade in Kenya to try to kind of grease the wheels of the plastic pipeline to get less plastic in the communities where it's breeding these vectors, which we've shown, and into sort of new products or just out of out of uh, people's way, right? So that they can't breed all of these yeah. mosquitoes. And so those are the two projects we have going on in Kenya right now. It's interesting. And well, I guess there is a Rafale fever one, but yeah, <laughs> I don't need to talk anymore. No, no, so. I... It, uh, I I think it's interesting that anthropogenic waste, you know, it contributes to this problem. Someone told me that in Brazil, and, and uh, you could tell me if this is true or not, that the caps for soda bottles fill with water. People throw them on the ground, they fill with water, and those can be breeding sites. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, supposedly it is Egypt, I only need a tablespoon of water. So it's not that much water that you actually need. Yeah. Um, but conditions need to be just right. So plastic so you, waste definitely contributes. So you said in Kenya, there there is not a lot of serious dengue. Is that correct? 
Yeah. So at least in our courts, we haven't found a lot of really severe dengue. Yeah. Most of the dengue is outpatient and patients do really well. Yeah. We found a lot of children and now our cohort studies include adults as well, who definitely have dengue viremia. Um, but they, yeah, they tend to fare quite well. And so it's interesting. It's, it's, it's really something that would be nice to figure out over time. Yeah. What are the the determinants of protection there. There are a lot of potentials. uh, Obviously in other populations, there is serious dengue. You think it's a uh, a genetic basis in the population maybe? That's the theory. You know, there are these, you know, paradigms that, that um, there's some genetic resistance to severe disease. It's possible since what we were just discussing, the fact that much human disease is actually immune based and right immune pathology. And so it could be that differences in the genetics and the way that, Mm -hmm. that, different people handle these um, infections and how revved up your immune system gets could actually prevent, inf- you know, the disease that we call severe dengue, yeah. which mm-hmm. probably has a, a big, huge basis in immune, in, in immunity truly. Um, but there could be other, there's other mm-hmm. theories too. Um, there's theories the, about the factors, the viruses. Go haven't on. the uh, Cubans done some research on uh, human genetic resistance to dengue? Yeah, I think, and then there was the the other yeah studies in the past with Halstead and the yeah and the the differences in in genetics tying to to the mm-hmm. so. There is a really nice paper from Maria Guzman that Carl mm-hmm. was referring to yes, so, yes. uh, during the dengue outbreaks in Cuba because Cuba has a very diverse popu- vast mm-hmm. diverse population mm-hmm. and it's not really mixed. Mm-hmm. So they found from HLA markers mm. and yes. it's really really nice work done i've guessed mm-hmm. 25 years ago maybe yes <laughs> yeah <laughs> exactly mm. yeah. so so uh, desiree yeah. when you do you typically travel to for your field work to to kenya yourself and maybe some people in your lab how does that work so the way it works is that i have incredible partners in kenya on the ground to do all of the work and uh-huh. i just get to work with them so we, uh, so mm-hmm. my in, the in country teams that I have in in Kenya and uh, Grenada and then also in Brazil are, are phenomenal. And so the work's going on, and I'm just there helping out and listening. And I I come pop in truly, and and we brainstorm together, and we we change things, and we talk about science, and 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 uh, and really, it's because the. The, there's just an incredible, incredible teams of, of scientists and field workers and mm-hmm. physicians that are on the ground. So, so was that there before you, or did you help, you know, establish it there? Um, yeah. So the teams we've built the teams together. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I am a bit of a team builder. That's true. Um, <laughs> but but some of it was inherited, right? Like the space and some of the contacts. I inherited from my mentor who had been working in Kenya for about 30 years. Um, Mm. And now some of those people have moved on and, you know, new generations are coming up. And so um, it's sort of a different, it's a luckily um, different models that are much more integrated now. And I think um, uh, the team structure really, really does pay off. I don't don't get to live at my field sites like Mauricio. (laughs) When is the last time you were, you were there? I last went in July. I brought my whole family with me. We were in the July of 2019. Okay. Um, we were starting off um, an R01, and uh, I brought the team of about 20 people from the west side of Kenya to the coast, where there's a team of another 25 people or so, and I had a huge, like, sort of kickoff team meeting and training. Mm-hmm. And so we were all together on the coast of Kenya in July of 2019. And I'm hoping I can get exemption from Stanford to travel in. February. So mm-hmm. fingers crossed that I'll make it there soon. So at the moment you can't go there. Yeah. Right now we're restricted up until January 4th, but I just have a feeling that on January 4th, they're going to extend the restriction. Yeah. So I'm trying to get in my exemption paperwork so I can go. What's, it's been a really long how, time. How has Kenya dealt with the pandemic? Do you know? Yeah, it's been really interesting. We, we, uh, you know, our work came to a halt and and we were stopped for about four months or so. Mm. And we put in a lot of, uh, a lot of, you know, procedures in place to protect our teams and to protect community and make sure that we weren't contributing to any sort of transmission. 
Um, and it was, you know, we work in Western Kenya and also in coastal Kenya. And, you know, we were afraid that everyone was going to be, cause we're doing, you know, we were going into people's houses and doing all of these, you know, a lot of work. And so we were worried that, you know, there was, uh, going to be great resistance. People were going to really fear COVID. Mm. And actually what we found is there wasn't a lot of fear around COVID. In fact, it was almost the opposite where we were really trying to educate people that this was something that was real and that should be taken seriously. And so, um, you know, we've had to change our work. Clearly we're not going in households anymore. We have these tents that we've set up to bring people out and, um, we've changed our procedures and our team has been safe and feels comfortable. But, um, I think on the whole, um, Kenya uh, did do a lot of shutdowns early on and kept numbers fairly low. There was also a lot of um, government intervention. There was a lot of government forced quarantine for people who were deemed positive. They tried to get testing up pretty quickly. I think now they're, I think, starting to see a second wave, just like most places in most countries in the world. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, yeah. I'm looking at the Johns Hopkins site. So they've had a total of 69,000 cases in Kenya and 1,200 deaths. Mm-hmm. So it's yeah. pretty much uh, nobody's spared, right? No one's spared. No, <laughs> no one is spared. Never. Uh, Louis, you, your uh, lab published a school paper on bridge vectors recently, this year, in fact. And I wondered if we could chat about uh, br- what is a bridge vector and, and what does it mean and so forth. Yeah, sure. Um, I don't particularly focus on bridge vectors, but Mm -hmm. it turns out this student I was uh, supervising was uh, stationed in Laos. Mm -hmm. um, And he was actually co-supervised by Paul Bray, who's the director of the Pasteur Institute in Laos, was interested in uh, the ecology of arboviruses. And specifically, he wanted to study the emergence of arboviruses at the interface between uh, sylvatic cycles and uh, the human cycle. Because for most arboviruses, the story is always the same. There is a virus circulating between non-human primates mm. or some other non-human animal in the forest, uh, and they are transmitted by uh, forest mosquitoes, essentially. And at some point in time, they will jump into the human population through a mechanism that involves these so-called bridge vectors, which make make the bridge between the two cycles. It's true for yellow fever, it's true for dengue, it's true true for for Zika. All of these viruses emerge at the interface between uh, Mm. the forest and uh, the human world. And so the features of a bridge vector uh, is that it's a mosquito or uh, an arthropod uh, that can bite a non-human animal, but also occasionally will bite a human. So those are particularly dangerous because uh, their uh, a very uh, flexible host preference mm-hmm. make them amenable to bite different hosts and uh, connect them uh, and transfer pathogens from one uh, another. And so uh, a good example of bridge vector is uh, the tiger mosquito, uh, the Asian tiger mosquito, Aedes albopictus, uh, which is an invasive mosquito that originates from Southeast Asia, but invaded the rest of the world in the last uh, few decades. This mosquito is particularly dangerous because it is uh, so um, um, uh, flexible in terms of its diet. It will bite pretty much anything. And uh, we think it could have been responsible for uh, in the emergence or at least contributed to the emergence of some, some arboviruses. So the bridge vectors um, are very difficult to identify uh, because they're not particularly um, human preferring, unlike the domestic vectors that we usually focus on because they are the main vectors when the human tr- transmission cycle has been triggered. Uh, those are often hidden in the forest, um, and, mm. and like Aedes albopictus, most of them are unknown. So it takes a lot of effort to go into sites uh, where uh, we think there could be some uh, sylvatic cycles uh, going on, and um, that's what that student in Laos was doing. He was trying to identify mosquitoes that would live there out in the forest, biting whatever animal mm. uh, that was there, but also occasionally I would bite a human because it was a place where there was a lot of um, uh, poaching and trafficking, all kinds of trafficking at the border of Laos and Vietnam. And so uh, because it was a 
very natural environment, but with some uh, human incursions, we thought it was a good spot to um, identify those bridge vectors. And so um, the, the key was to essentially uh, go there. Uh, it was like a day, dry, a day drive and then a few hours of boat up the river, uh, camping there in the forest and catching mosquitoes that would uh, be attracted uh, to uh, the baits, which were the, the people of the team. So it was a very brave um, PhD uh, project. <laughs> Uh, and and eventually we, we didn't quite catch uh, the the major uh, bridge vector that we would uh, we would have hoped to. Um, we did catch a lot of Aedes albopictus, but that's a known bridge mm. vector. Uh, we also identified another one called Aedes malayensis, mm. uh, which um, turned out to be a vector that was uh, recently identified in Singapore because it breeds in uh, forest parks of Singapore. And some people before us uh, had hypothesized that perhaps it was kind of boosting transmission of arboviruses like dengue or, mm. um, or Zika. Uh, because those mosquitoes typically are, are disregarded by surveillance campaigns. Mm. They're not purely uh, human biting mosquitoes, uh, but because they are competent for arboviruses, and that's what we also confirmed that Aedes malayensis was also competent. Uh, it may be um, a cryptic vector in those uh, urban parks of Singapore, and perhaps also at the at the human animal interface uh, in remote forests of Laos. So one of the things you do is bring these mosquitoes back to the lab and infect them and see how well they support reproduction, right? Yeah, that's a general pattern in my research. What we do in my lab is typically uh, the same. Um, uh, the same scheme where we um, begin with field work and field observations. We try to understand something that's going on in the very complex reality of the field. And we uh, bring back samples to the lab to mm -hmm. try to simplify the situation by controlling uh, factors, um, which are manifold. And oftentimes it's a simplistic version of the field, which requires to go back to the field eventually to confirm that the observations we make in mm. the lab and the conclusions from our simplistic experiments uh, make sense in a more uh, realistic situation. So we do bring a lot of viruses and mosquitoes from uh, the field, uh, which we then put in contact in a, in a biosafety um, facility. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we try and understand what are the factors, whether they're genetic factors on the mosquito side, genetic factors on the virus side, or environmental parameters, uh, including biotic factors of the environment, like mm -hmm. microbes, um, the virome that Jonathan was talking about. All of these factors, we try to disentangle them uh, to figure out what's driving arbovirus transmission in a field situation. So these mosquitoes were collected in Laos. Do you bring them back to Paris? Yeah, we do. Ah. <laughs> we do a lot, yeah. Not that, just from Laos, from everywhere in the world. And you have any problem with We have a collection of uh, like 25 or 30 mosquito colonies from all around mm. the world. Well, I, but that reminds me, I went to visit at UTMB, the mosquito, um, whatever you call it. I forgot the insectary? word. Sorry, insectary, insectary yeah. yeah. Insectary. Actually, they also have a tick one there, which is really cool. But yeah, uh, the Nikos, right? He told me they have more mosquitoes than anybody else. It's just so mm -hmm. cool. And they're all in little boxes flying around. Um, that's so, very familiar. Yeah, yeah was, I've never <laughs> seen one before. It was just great. Um, they, ha they have a colony there that were the most beautiful mosquitoes. That's Sabitis uh, cyaneus. Yeah, I have yeah, it here. Exactly well. <laughs> it's a beautiful mosquito. Is that the one with the fancy wings? Yeah, the blue one with it's the a, fancy. Oh, blue. Okay. Yeah, it's blue iridescent on the. Legs look like feathers. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, he told me once they they lost a mosquito and it took them 12 hours to find it and it was behind the CO2 tank. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that funny? Um, anyway, I, Louis. I visited uh, UTMB once uh, when Steve Higgs was there mm -hmm. a long time ago and he told me they had problems with <clears throat> mosquitoes coming in to their insectary from the city 
because uh, the conditions there were so comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. They want to go to the Mosquito Hotel. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, Lou, Louis, when you bring these to the, these mosquitoes to, to Paris, you have to breed them there. Is that right, or you have? In, in yeah, that- we we keep them in an insectary, which oh. is a pretty regular insectary where the conditions are like uh, Mauritius. Uh, Warm mm-hmm. and humid. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. Uh, most of the mosquitoes we study come from tropical areas. So, uh, yeah, we try to reproduce the conditions so that they're happy. And um, the challenge is always to maintain them alive and mm-hmm. not just ment- maintain them alive, but also um, make them reproduce. Right. And so the key is to uh, blood feed them. Because if they're um, hmm. human biting mosquitoes, they will readily feed on yourself, but that's not allowed and that's not desirable to feed mosquitoes on yourself. Uh, so we typically have um, artificial blood feeders. So we purchase blood, like rabbit blood or sheep blood or, or various options, mm-hmm. which we introduce into this um, artificial system. And mosquitoes that usually very reluctant to feed on the system, especially if they're uh, freshly collected from the field. Mm -hmm. So it's always kind of a challenge and we need to know them very well. We we baby them really to uh, make them uh, blood feed and then lay eggs because they won't lay eggs if they don't blood feed. Yeah, right. So you, in your paper, you say they are, they are not attracted to human scent. How, How do you measure that? Yeah, in that particular study, we collaborated with a group at the London School of Tropical um, Medicine where uh, they use what uh, what is called an olfactometer. Mm-hmm. Uh, so basically, you um, measure the attractiveness of an odor uh, to uh, the mosquitoes by um, counting how many mosquitoes uh, will fly towards a trap mm-hmm. um, as opposed to a control trap that doesn't have the odor. And so you uh, release mosquitoes in that olfactometer, uh, and uh, the odor is delivered through uh, various ways. But the one we used was a piece of stocking that um, the same student again, Elliot Muir, uh, was uh, wearing. He, he wore it for uh, a few uh, hours a day. I don't remember, so that it kept its odor. And so uh, the same stocking without any contact with a human was used as the control. And so wow. the, the assay is just to measure how many mosquitoes actually uh, fly, so yeah. how many are activated, and then how many will go to the trap where the odor is um, is coming from. That's great. I love it. I was going to say, do you have a specific chemical that's human, but you have a sock? <laughs> yeah. It's amazing to see that you know, a lot of the – a lot of the approaches they used back in the 50s and 60s are still hanging around because that was an approach they used to trap mosquitoes back in the 50s. They'd use dirty socks. <laughs> yeah. no. If it works, why not uh, yeah. Why not yeah. continue to use it, right? That's cool. I love it. If I ever go to Paris, I'd love to visit and uh, see that in operation. Of course, yeah. Uh, let's, let's talk to Mauricio a bit. Mauricio, you have this paper... Um, about flavy infections associated with cerebrovascular events. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, uh, yes. So this is, has been discussed a lot for people who are working with dengue mm-hmm. uh, because the classical hemorrhagic fever, it's something that's really well described in Asia, but it's not something that we see a lot in, in the Americas. The severity of the disease in America is different from what we see in Asia. Mm-hmm. And this, at some point, the WHO changed the classification of dengue, tried to understand better about that. But something that we start to see, um, we, we, not to start to see, we start to count that. Um, we developed this a few years ago, a program here um, that I put a, one of my PhD students at that time that was, she was an MD also. She's a really bright girl uh, working full time in the hospital looking for dengue. But not only dengue, but every possible 
uncommon manifestation of dengue during the outbreaks. And one thing that we start to find, and we found several times, was um, cerebrovascular events. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, one talking about strokes related in, in dengue. And patients that were admitted to the hospital with this neurovascular disease, and nobody even thinking about dengue, but since we were in the middle of dengue outbreak, we start to count that, and we start to mm -hmm. find that. And when we got Zika, we also found uh, at least one case of Zika. And after we published that paper, we found a few more. And this can be explained uh, by uh, dengue biology, especially NS1 biology, and there were several models developed, especially by Eva Harris group, uh, trying to show this in mouse and whatever, but we actually found this in human people. And what's even more interesting, uh, when we published, I think that one month ago, we got a patient co-infected with SARS-CoV-2 and dengue, and exactly, he died up in a cerebrovascular event. He has mm -hmm. a thrombosis uh, in the brain. Uh, this is important, but this is a part of the... Uh, as I said, uh, a, uh, a bigger program. We, we have a program here that goes from, we do a lot of viral surveillance uh, from human cohorts, uh, prospective cohorts. We have a neighborhood in the city that we are following mm -hmm. every year to see what's going on about dengue, Zika, chick, whatever, incidence and prevalence but also uh, doing a very strong hospital surveillance system. So we have um, this disease here. So these diseases, uh, several arboviruses here, and we have a very good hospital. So we can do this uh, in a degree of uh, granularity that the other places cannot do uh, because we have the resources here. And now the resources are going to go even better. We just got funded in the program grant by NIH with uh, Nikos uh, from UTMB and Kate Hanley from New Mexico State University to do hmm. uh, a complete surveillance of vector, human, and non-human primates in the region. So what do you think is the, the mechanism of the, the cerebrovascular events in the case of dengue? You mentioned NS1, so is that... Yes. I believe that NS1 has an action in the endothelium, okay? So this, uh, mm -hmm. and we also at the same point, you have uh, systemic effects in the dengue due to, low, uh, to the cytokine storm that's going to lead to several alterations in this stuff that can either go for a bleeding or a... Um, uh, vascular uh, event that mm -hmm. you go to uh, the what happens is that the the arterial uh, of the brain just gonna close and we're gonna have an event mm -hmm. and uh, this problem is much more frequent than we are find so we are mm -hmm. planning now to do a more proactive surveillance uh, on that and you think it's not just dengue it's other Viruses with an well, NS1. I think that dengue, well, for SARS-CoV, this has been demonstrated since yeah. the beginning, uh, yeah. but uh, not for dengue before. Yeah. Uh, hmm. I think that other, uh, uh, we just found also, we just published a uh, very similar effect with ileus. Ileus is a not well, uh, it's not well no hmm. flavivirus, but it's... Uh, pretty close to St. Louis encephalitis and West Nile, whatever. Uh, it's a virus discovered in Brazil. Uh, and also we found a case again with a cerebrovascular event. Hmm. Now, in this case of the co-infected patient that you mentioned, do you think that patient died because of the cumulative effect of both uh, viruses? It's difficult to say. Yeah. Uh, this guy got in the hospital at the beginning with a uh, pretty clear dengue-like symptoms, uh, was not a severe dengue, he was discharged, 
and then came back uh, two days later with uh, COVID symptoms and mm. then had this event late in the same day yeah. and died really fast. Yeah. So what's the situation with uh, SARS-CoV-2 in Brazil now? Well, it's, it's complicated. Uh, well, we, d- we haven't not finished our first wave, but we still we are now seeing something that is kind of expected. Because what happened, we never did a complete shutdown. Okay, mm-hmm. our we, we kind of did that. And what happened is that the high society or the people, wealthy people, they really get out of the streets. And we had an outbreak in the lower classes at the beginning. So this outbreak was was getting down uh, and the government relaxed the Mm. rules. So these people from the upper classes start to live the life like it's... It's the last day of their lives. Restaurants, movie theaters, bars, nightclubs. And now what we are seeing is that these higher classes are getting back to the hospital. Uh, My hospital is a big hospital. Uh, At one point, uh, two months ago, I had, we had 250 people in ICUs. We are glad that we have 250 ICU beds. Hmm. Wow. But, but <laughs> it, it is amazing. Listen, to have an idea, I shut down my lab for any arbovirus research in the past six months. I'm doing a little bit, but uh, I hmm. transformed my lab in a COVID diagnostic lab. Mm-hmm. This week, I will complete 100,000 PCRs performed in my lab. Wow. It's a lot of PCR. It, 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 it's, it's amazing. Wow. And uh, Louis, about France, how's France doing with the pandemic? We're currently in the middle of the second wave. Yeah. We're under lockdown. It's a much uh, easier lockdown. Not easier, no. It's not the correct word. It's a um, um, milder lockdown. So the restrictions are less than in the first lockdown where Everybody was staying at home, essentially. Now people can go to their workplace if their hmm. uh, function requires it. Uh, so sometimes it's hard to believe we're under a lockdown um, and we're waiting for the effects of the lockdown right now because there's always this lag of a few weeks. So right now we're anxiously looking at the at the, the epidemic curve to see whether there is any effect, hmm. but it's ramping up and it's really frightening. Hmm. Yeah, it's uh, really, it's amazing. But I do, th- I do like that we could have a nice talk about other viruses because uh, there are lots, <laughs> as you heard from this episode, there's a lot of other interesting virology out there besides co- SARS-CoV-2. And on TWIV, we've mainly talked about the pandemic this year. I want one, I have one more question for all of you. Uh, and uh, let me start with you, Jonathan. If you had not been a scientist, what would you have done? Wow. I, I think I know your answer, no? <laughs> <laughs> well, assuming I was probably good enough and other things. <laughs> I don't know. Actually, if I was not a scientist, dream goal would have been to help kids. So probably social work. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. You like kids? Yeah, I like people in general. So. Okay, <laughs> great. Desiree, what if you, what would you have done? I always thought if I wasn't going to go into science, I was going to be a teacher. But having three kids at home, trying to homeschool them, I'm really happy that I made it in science. And so are all the children of the world. Uh, so I don't know. Uh, I think maybe like an anthropologist or something like that. Okay. Mauricio, what about you? Well, uh, I had an opportunity to be a professional sport. I Mm. received a proposal uh, to be a professional volleyball player, but I'm not that tall. So I decided I was 18 at that time. I said, okay, come on. I'm never going to be good on that. I cannot live on that. So I decided to go to medical school. But as I said, as I saw your guitar in the backyard, I would love to be a professional guitar player. That would be my dream. Yeah, that'd be cool. For I sure. don't have the skills for that also. Yeah, yeah, neither do I. That's for sure. 
How about you, Louis? I think I could have been a journalist. And sometimes I guess it's not too far from uh, what I do now. Mm. Uh, you know, writing up stories yes. from facts. <laughs> yes, that's right. So you like to write. I'm not trying to go away from the truth and still making a story out yeah, of it. Yeah, sure. How about you, Carol? Uh, that's a hard question for me. I can't imagine any other career, but I like Jonathan's answer because uh, I like people. I like kids. Mm. And uh, my brother is a social worker. So uh, I tried to talk him into being a chemist, but uh, that didn't fit him. And so uh, social work would be attractive to me. All right. I love I love asking people. I get such a, a great array of uh, of answers. It's it's a lot of fun. All right, that is our special episode of TWIV at ASTMH. Um, you can find TWIV at microbe.tv slash TWIV. If you have any questions or comments, send them to TWIV at microbe.tv. And if you like what we do, consider supporting us. You can go over to microbe.tv slash contribute uh, to do that. My guest today from Virginia Tech, Jonathan Auguste. Thanks for joining us, Jonathan. Thank you, Vincent. From Colorado State University, Carol Blair. Thanks, Carol. Thank you. It was an honor. From Stanford University, Desiree Labeau. Thank you, Desiree. Thank you so much, Vincent, and all of you guys. From the Institut Pasteur, Louis Lambrecht. Thanks, Louis. My pleasure. Thank you. And from U Preto Medical School in Brazil, Mauricio Nogueira. Thank you, Mauricio. Thank you, Vincent. Thank you, guys. Good to see these familiar faces I haven't seen for a while. And I hope to see you back here in Brazil, Vincent, for the Brazilian meeting for virology soon. I'd love, love to, come to back. go to Brazil again. I would too. Okay, Carol. <laughs> yeah. All of them, all of you are invited to come back. I yeah. think that everybody already have in Brazil. Yeah, Not I am. I'm right. in. I've not been yet. <laughs> yeah. Everyone else already, but mm. uh, Jonathan. <laughs> I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.blog. I'd like to thank Greg Ebel and the American Society for Tropical Medicine and Hygiene for the invitation to record TWIV for their annual meeting. I also would like to thank the American Society for Virology and the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIV and Ronald Jenkins. For the music, this episode of TWIV was recorded, edited, and posted by me, Vincent Racaniello. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs>